a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a run. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expounding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into a, an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very profound. Expanding reality. As the old saying goes, I've been standing all here all day bawling out my wares. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, Mark uh, Ali, yeah. so good to see you, brother, man. Welcome back. Uh, as Fantastic. always, this is just going to be a badass conversation. You have a new book out, Europe's Roswell, 40 Years Since Impact. I love the subtitle, love everything about it. And we're going to talk about Europe's Roswell because I thought that that, oh, look at that beautiful cover there right is, here, guys. There it is, yeah. Look at that version in the show notes, audio only audience for this smashing uh, cover, but as well as this handsome bearded man here sitting before us, <laughs> Mark fucking Ollie. Um, so I thought Europe's Roswell was the Rendlesham enigma, but you're talking about Roswell over here for us, like you catered to the American Oz audience for this actual Roswell, which I'm wearing the t-shirt of. Again, audience, check the video version of this, man. We're rocking shit. Yeah. yeah uh, just, so go ahead. I was just going to say there's, there's more crossovers with this case, with the American Roswell, than there is with any other British Roswell. It's worth saying that. So, you Perfect. know, it, it, it almost literally is. When we get to the story a bit later on, so I won't give any spoilers away, uh, ye you'll start to you'll start to see the crossover. But yeah. Just, for the audience's sake here, Mark and I geek out uh, whenever we get to <laughs> hang out together. We also do a Frequency Theorist show uh, that you can find in a few places. So look, at, look us up for that where... Me, Mark, uh, what is it? Uh, Ryan Cook, our dear friend, Ben, Ben Carroll, a bunch of folks in and out join us. It's like a rotating door of badass musicians and stuff. And we just hang out and talk shit about all kinds of stuff. So join us for that. But also, Mark, you have been on uh, episode 117 and episode 192 officially here, uh, including the one that we're speaking on here, which I think is going to be like 238 or something, dude. We're just going weird. And I know that that's a lot of numbers, audience. So I'll just go ahead and link that all directly in the show description. You know how we like to make this easy on everybody out there. We want to thank the audience as well for hanging out with us. Uh, Mark, uh, like I said, my, my wife and I, before uh, we were hanging out here, I was like, oh, my God, I get to hang out with Mark Holly. This is always a fantastic conversation with you, and especially just because of your breadth of everything that you do. So we know you as a TV presenter, musician, historian, archaeologist, but now we're going to bring you in as ufologist. So how the hell, first and foremost, my friend, yes. as an archaeologist, take a look at UFOs and say, I'll take a stab at that. Well, uh, I am I am actually a witness uh, of UFO activity, um, which goes way, way back. Uh, I mean, I've always had an interest in archaeology. I've, I've Probably people out there will know that started when I was eight years old and my dad dumped me in a trench and got me digging. So uh, he was a volunteer digger. I was a volunteer digger. And, you know, since I found my first piece of Roman pottery, that was it. I was hooked. Fast forward to when I'm... Um, 14, I think I was, in the summer of 1976. Over here, the summer of 1976, it was so hot that the clay ground in the area where I live here just baked. It literally baked and became solid. So... Um, we went, we went out camping, me and a couple of mates that I had. Uh, we just went out. We did all the usual things that teenagers do, you know, climbing trees, falling in rivers, making rope swings, dens, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, but it kind of got to the evening time. We decided we were going to put up a tent. Now, back in the 1970s, tents are made of canvas, and they come with these big wooden pegs. So we've got this tent. We're banging away. Not a chance. We're not going to get this tent up because it's like hammering wood into concrete. It just isn't going to happen. So what we did was dump the tent flat, put the sleeping bags on top of the tent, so we slept out under the stars. Now then, where we were, out in the countryside, no light pollution, so it's worth knowing that. Early hours of the morning, something woke me up. I'm pretty sure I remember it was a fox uh, going past and being nosy, and, as they do. Um, and I wake up, two mates are kind of, over there asleep somewhere, big lumps in the dark. And the star field is just incredible. Now, there are, there are folks who will know what stars look like. You can see the Milky Way and all sorts when there's no light pollution. So I'm just lying there appreciating what I'm seeing because you don't usually get it in this country. Um, and then on the horizon, I just see this, this really bright 
pinprick of light. It's about two or three times brighter than a planet. So it's really, really bright. And in the 1970s, we didn't have any uh, visible satellites or anything like that. So it's unusual to see anything like a star of that brightness moving. And it's moving basically in a straight line towards me. So it's, it's coming from the horizon. And eventually it gets to sort of just over the top of me. And then all of a sudden it goes bang, 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 and gone. Now, at this point, I'm lying there thinking, right, okay, I don't know anything that we've got that does that. I have absolutely no idea what I've just seen. It literally went, you know, almost to that horizon and then going the other way, almost to that horizon, you know, about four different bounces back to its original sort of position on this line it was on and then shoom, gone disappeared just like someone had switched it off so i'm thinking what the hell is that so anyway told me mates the following days i didn't believe a word of it made a little note in my diary fast forward another five years at this point i've you know i'm now 18, 19, that sort of age. And I've gone through art college. I've done all that. You know, I've trained in archaeology with Liverpool University, so I'm now an archaeologist, uh, you know, and I'm playing sessions. In the early 80s, I started playing sessions as a drummer. So I'm now in the local studios and we've finished a session. So it's quite late. It's about one one thirty in the morning and I'm driving home and there's a big hill up, up at the back here near where I live. And I thought, oh, do you know what? I'm going to go and sit up there and wind down because some of these sessions are long. I mean, you know yourself, you can you can be in the studio, you know, from dark to dark. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll go and sit up there and wind down. So I'm sat on the hill. And where I live is quite handy. If you get on top of this hill, over to one side, you can see Manchester. Over to the other side, you can see Liverpool. And between the two, you can see the entire Mersey Valley with the whole of my village and the rest of the town spreading out in front of me. So I'm on top of the hill. It's about two o'clock in the morning. And way over to my left is a coal-powered fire station. So you've got eight of these big, you know, power station funnels billowing out what is essentially steam. And I'm looking at this power station thinking, that's a bit odd. The steam looks like it's lighting up. What's going on over there? Through the steam, over the top of one of these open mouths, comes a, a ship of some kind covered in lights. Now, the first reaction is it's got to be a helicopter. It has to be a helicopter. But then I'm thinking, hang on a minute, you don't ride a helicopter through steam the same temperature as a kettle. It's coming out of these funnels at like 40 degrees, you know, so that, you don't do that for a start. And it looks a bit like the scout ships in Close Encounters of the Third Kind because that came out in whatever it was, 1976, 77. So I was familiar with these little ships. And the lights on it are doing the same thing. So you've got these floodlights that are scanning the ground and they're changing. One minute they're white, then they go blue, and then another one will go red, and then it'll go blue and then white and then so they're scanning and it's moving up the north bank of the river which is where the least habitation is uh, and it's just it's just slowly moving up and i'm watching this thing just like i'm watching it on tv it's it's amazing it gets almost directly in front of me which is where uh, all the lights from the town are so you can see this thing sort of crossing the light pollution and then all the lights go off and sideways on, it looked to be about the size of a seven and a half ton truck. You've just got this blob. And then it shoots straight up vertically into the sky. And I'm like, wow, I have got to write that down. So there I am, diary, to make notes, you know, so time, you know, all this, that and the other. 2.30 a.m., et cetera, et cetera. Now, if that was, if that was the, the sum total of it, I mean, I was converted at that point. I'm like, yeah, there are, you know, flying saucers out there. This is the second time. And it, it was quite spectacular. Fast forward 11 years. And we have over here, we have Jenny Randalls and Mike Huff, which is uh, two of the researchers. And they write a book called Mysteries of the Mersey Valley and it gets published. So I think we're in 1993. So in 93, I buy this book. And on the cover is a flying saucer with the light coming out of it. On the other side of the power station, out towards the Liverpool end. So I'm like, oh, what's this? Let's have a look. So, you know, have a look at the story. And it turns out that a flight coming into Liverpool Airport in 1981 saw this disc that looked like a light bulb, looked down on it from above. And it's stationary over the Wirral. 
and they're flying into Liverpool Airport, so they report this. Then there's some campers on top of the Wirral itself camping on this this open area. They see this thing, but they see it side on. And all of a sudden it switches on and all these lights come on underneath it. And it flies over them, up the river, and disappears through the steam on the power station. So I'm like, well, I've got to link all this together. So in 2020, so you now you're now like whoa, thirty odd years after it all happened, I linked it all together for another book that uh, Jason Gleaves is writing for um, Philip Mantle, and it turns out because I, I actually I've got a, a few of the things in here. Basically, uh, the account that I put in here where I've strung it together, round about half past two, you've got the aeroplane. Just after half past two, you've then got these campers, and then a couple of minutes later. You've got me, and basically it's a straight line. When you when you join the dots, it's it's a fourteen mile straight line of this thing coming straight up the valley. Now, time, you know, past witnesses in different locations, different researchers, different sets of of data. That's a complete account of when it was first spotted and when it disappeared. So that's pieced together. So that now has taken on even greater significance because, you know, totally independent of me, good old Jenny Randalls has stuck it in another book for Sigma Leisure. You know, that was years ago. And and it just, it all joins up. Everything then makes, makes sense, which then makes me obviously a, you know, a witness uh, to something that was quite extraordinary. Um, I mean, uh, I can I could kick a few other stories around which are not in the book um, because obviously, as an archaeologist, when you're out in the field, I mean, I can distinctly remember doing we we, we did uh, Buxton in Derbyshire, which is out on the moorlands, and we, we were doing a dig there at this this private house, and I can remember in the evening, you know, uh, this lady coming running in, one of the dig team coming running in and going. <gasps> we've just been buzzed by a UFO. And I'm like, oh, what do you mean? She said, well, we're all camping out there on the field and this big silver disc thing just buzzed us, flew over the top, literally dive-bombed us and then vanished at, at high speed. And that's not the first time that sort of thing's happened when I've been out with, you know, other archaeologists, you know. So people that spend a lot of time outdoors, which, you know, we do, especially on sites and things like that, it is quite common to, to, to see things that you can't explain, you know, doing things up in the skies. So knowing that, given that background information, you know, it's it's not too unusual for, you know, archaeologists to take an interest in other things, which is actually why I got involved in the crash. So if, if you want to sort of move on to that, we... We can do. Fire I away. Definitely do. Guys, remember yeah. always to find him located down in the show description as well as Europe's Roswell 40 years since impact. We are going to get into this. But I mean, I would think that archaeologists as well have recognized in Renaissance paintings and artworks and all kinds of things. Biblical tales, Book of Enoch. It's UFOs have been with humanity since humanity has been around, if not longer. So it is interesting to take. Have you have you done that at all? Dove into the historical archaeological references of UFOlogy. Well, yeah, funnily, in recent times, I've done a talk, a PowerPoint talk called The History of UFOs, and I do yeah. exactly that. Yeah, there you go. Um, I mean, yeah, they're, they're there all along, you know, these unidentified flying craft. I mean, good old Eric von Daniken and, you know, a lot of the other folks out there that have done work way going way back to the 1950s. You know, there's been a lot. Uh, and then uh, the sort of what's happened with the documentation in the, you know, the 19th, the 20th, the 21st century, things have definitely escalated. For sure. I don't think that's because it's happening more. I actually think because witnesses are more aware, we've got more uh, recording technology, you know, in the hands of the general public. And, you know, every phone has a camera now, whereas, you know, go back to the 60s and 70s, it was more specialized and and so on going back. Uh, so I just think, you know, perhaps the same amount of stuff's been going on and to some extent in the same ways, but it's just not being recorded in quite the same way. Mm. Good point. Great point. Mm. All right. So I want to hear what you think about the official Roswell story. It's been thrown around. I also want to hear the most ridiculous one in your mind, because there's so many versions of this story, all the way from Mengele. He took a bunch of misfortunate, uh, unfortunate folks, uh, did horrible things to them, jammed them in something experimental and dumped them over here on purpose to be found. And there are so many wild stories with this. So I definitely want to hear your official account and, and what you have to say about it. But I definitely want to know your favorite, most ridiculous one as well. It's a weather balloon, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> is that it? Oh, okay. Episode over. Of course it Guys, is. It's a weather balloon. Yeah, that's the end of it. 
end of episode. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm being facetious. Um, and to some extent, to everything you've just said, I could have said yes. Um, because, uh, do you know, uh, the, it's like the more you dig, the more you fall down this hole. So you have to, how can I put it? Wow. In archaeology, when we have like a big pile of dirt, what we tend to do is we put it through a sieve and whatever sticks in the sieve, you know, we then go through that and then we pick out the finds. So going through the same process with Roswell, uh, what you end up with is obvious cover up material. You know, that when, when it's shook through the sieve, you end up with a few little nuggets left and you, you can just see, you know, you can see what, what's going on. You know, they, they, they try to cover up the newspaper report they tried to silence everybody that had any connections to what was going on uh, they cleaned up the debris to the nth degree so that when archaeologists went out there i think it was in the 1990s for national geographic all they found was little tiny beads of metal everywhere although i have to say recently a metal detectorist has had a piece of foil off there which is identical to the foil we've got over here so yet another link uh, so you know that something happened there's no doubt about that something clearly happened um you know, the Matt Brussel, you know, everybody's criticised him for not picking up and keeping the pieces. It came out recently that possibly he did and that he actually hid a case in one of his old houses with the fragments in. So somewhere out there, guys, out in the US, there's probably a very similar case to the one we've got. There's another crossover with fragments in you know, knocking around somewhere out there. So, I mean, honestly, the crossovers uh, between what's, what went on at Roswell and here are just, uh, they're uncanny. You know, one major witness, one cleanup operation, one newspaper report, you know, everything, the cover-up, the type of team, the stuff that was left afterwards, you know, uh, you, you'll you'll soon see why it, it's, you know, it comes up as as Europe's Roswell because it literally is. That's what it is. It's a it's like a replay for early 1980s. But yeah, from my own point of view, I think we came out of the Second World War with a hell of a lot more stuff than anybody's willing to, to comment on. Um, and I have said in other interviews relating to the debris in the past, I've said, well, you know, since the end of the Second World War, it's 90 years, you know, since Roswell, it's 70 years. What on earth could we have done with that technology, let's say, in 100 years? You know, that's where we're going with it. You know, at the end of the day, from the end of the – well, from the beginning of the Second War, World War to where we are now, it's it's nearly – it's nearly 100 years of development. You know, um, chuck a few other bits and bobs in there like, you know, Tesla and Einstein and, you know, goodness knows what other folks have been working on this. Like you say, um, what was it, Von Braun? Mengele, you know, this chuck all of the big names in there. Uh, you've got the potential for, you know, NASA not being a space agency, but, you know, a product development company, you know, shall we say. So, yeah, um, we're probably singing off the same hymn sheet on this one. Um, it's not a weather balloon. Absolutely. Categorically not. Those photographs that came out, you know, in, in the Roswell Reporter or whatever it was, that came out on the day and then they came out the day after. Those photographs of the cover up side of things, uh, they've just been completely debunked. You know, they've, they've been absolutely torn to shreds. Um, and witnesses who were in that vicinity at the time have said that stuff was switched out behind the scenes. Um, so, you know, there's no smoke without fire. Um, not sure about alien bodies. Jury's out on the alien bodies side of that. Um, but, you know, if you, I mean, you introduced Mengele, what was going on in the Second World War. So, you know, if you're building the spaceship, why not engineer the pilots? You know, that's the yeah. theory. Uh, yeah, that's it. All sorts it. of wild yeah. stuff that they were working with. Plus, they were into all the esoteric stuff. So you're talking about, you know, uh, after World War II, really what happened, some people say surprisingly, is that uh, the Nazis infiltrated everything. And that really half of them went to CIA and then half of them went to NASA and then all over the place. So it wasn't sort of like, um, oh, we're just going to come over here and you're going to work with us now. It was an infiltration. So some people say that the Germans lost the war, but the Nazis did not. And so then you would say <laughs> that their propaganda, their media campaign, their ability to perception manage, which is really what NASA is, never a straight answer. It's a perception management campaign, in my opinion. And uh, then you take things like that. And so this is where propaganda, I feel, really took off. And this is where sort of what the hell's going on with our reality at its core started to really be flimsy for a lot of folks. Mm. And they, they started to be more susceptible to mind control. And this is where a lot of it was rolled out. Well, uh, obviously, obviously, all the experimental work that was done to back that and to back 
you know, technology and medicine and, you know, pretty much everything was uh, played about with in one form or another uh, during the Second World War. So, you know, that's that's where it's all going back to. I don't think there's any doubt about that, because, again, going back to the archaeological sieve, you know, if you shake all the rubbish through and you start picking out the nuggets, those nuggets end up looking extremely similar to what's going on in the Second World War. You know, you, you, it's, it's not something you can... Um, there you go. Look at all that lot. Yeah, there's the debris. You can see the debris photographs in, in that montage. Um, so with this, this is what we're talking about. This you think is planted. Jesse Marcel, um, this is what you think was... What are your thoughts on this, by the way? I'm just well, curious. I mean, that particular photograph is quite an interesting one uh, because I... Um, I, <laughs> off the record, uh, I do a certain amount of facial analysis um, and that guy's not telling the truth. Huh. That That is a look of guilt. There's absolutely no doubt about it whatsoever. He is absolutely not sick. happy. Sepuku eyes, Sepoku eyes, something like that. Uh, yeah, he's, he's he's not happy doing that. Um, the the body stance and everything. I mean, some people might argue it's because of the way he's he's posed, uh, but no, uh, I've not seen anything that. You know, I mean, you don't look like that if you've just recovered something like this, and you're sort yeah, of squashing a. Yeah, he looks deadly serious, and the other the other guy's clearly posed. You know, he's uh, he's just poking it for the camera, but it, it's no. There's no way it was a weather balloon. Um, if you actually, there's a book called Crash at Corona, which is quite an important one, which I think slipped through the net. That came out in the 90s. Can't remember the owner now, uh, the author now, but um, what they cover is the fact that actually there were two impacts. Uh, it looks more likely at Roswell that two sources actually hit each other. Uh, one of them is the one that's the famous, you know, up against a rock with two aliens hanging out of it. That's one of them. Um, but actually, there's a second impact. Yeah, that's it, Crash at Corona. Uh, if you really want to sort of, Mid mid range kind of critical analysis. That's that's probably the best book to get. But there's a beautiful plan in there that shows you where the two impact sites were, and they're several miles apart in the desert. And you know they 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 really take things apart. So that's that's a good one. That's worth having a look at. I think that's got a lot of valid uh, valid points and valid material in it. And if you, if you don't mind, explain the uh, title of this book for the audience members that may not know. Um, Corona is, I think it's the name of the ranch, isn't it? Where it came down because when they say it's at Roswell, New Mexico, it's Roswell is just the nearest point, if you like, uh, on a map, you the know, it's station. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. It didn't hit that station. It actually came down elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, which again, actually is an interesting overlap with what we're talking about in Wales, because the nearest place there that you can put a pin in the map is Clanilla, which is this little village outside Aberystwyth. But actually the crash is a couple of miles outside the village. So is Corona and Clanilla uh, the same in some way? Do they mean the same thing? No, no, there's okay. no, there's no, uh, there's well, no, that. The, it's, it, it's just being a bit more specific about the locations. Right. And, um, and, and this is what's interesting about this too, is because some people say that this had a massive impact in 1947 and changed the game for everything. Uh, and it happened technically at Corona in Corona, New Mexico, which is just over, like you said, uh, yeah. Roswell is credited because it's the closest, uh, yeah. sheriff station that Mac yeah. took the, took his story and some debris to, but the, the interesting part about that, too, is in 2020, we also had something else of a similar ilk that sort of, one could say, changed the face of this place, which may also sort of tie into what's going on here. If you can think yeah. of this being a disease of some kind that dropped out of the sky and then maybe infiltrated with AI, which is a fun part of the story. I don't know if you've heard this part, that Go really on. the beings <laughs> that came out um, were some sort of artificial intelligence or AI or some sort of parasite that whenever officials went to go investigate, every single one that came in contact with, they just took over. And so it's sort of like this body snatcher's idea that really it was a parasitic implant that uh, just sort of took over and infiltrated parts of the government. And of course, now you've got access to high level military and political officials. And so then, you know, we could possibly excuse some of the lizard turd behavior is all I'm saying, <laughs> because maybe it was something like this. I don't know. I've, I'm I'm yet Fine. to run across any biologicals. I mean, as an archaeologist, I am, well, you know what I'm like. I'm kind of, you know, if it quacks like a duck, it's a duck kind of shoot, it's a duck kind of thing. So, I mean, well, as an archaeologist, that's how I got involved with this crash in Wales, because when Gary contacted me, he actually wanted me to go on site and hopefully do a dig, you know, archaeologically to recover, you know, more debris or bits of the crash craft or, or whatever, um, which again, they've tried at Roswell and with extremely limited success, they've had, you know, 
fragments. But the same thing is true in Wales as well. We we went there, we examined it. The cleanup operation was was second to none. There was just nothing there that, that I could get involved in as an archaeologist. Uh, but that didn't rule out the story. And it certainly got me involved then as a producer because I went on to do the documentary version of it uh, in 2008 to celebrate 25 years. But the idea of the being lizard people and you know, almost, you know, either electronically or, you know, virus wise, gassing these people and changing them. And, you know, I mean, it, I suppose within the realms of science fiction, all things are possible. But then I'd like to see a bit of evidence of that, you know. Ooh, so uh, we can do evidence ooh. right here. I'll show you all the masks the politicians are wearing and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's very oh, yeah, interesting yeah, when you see yeah, yeah. how the people yeah. change. Also, when their eyes blink, you know, you'll see some of these awesome things. Who knows if this is visual effects or Who not? Knows? No one has taken this shit seriously. But I do, again, like you, yeah. find it fun to yeah. discuss in the realm of possibility because then, like I said, it honestly, if it wasn't some sort of parasitic overlay that just took over people let's air quotes people at a, at a level and just hijack their consciousness to where they they weren't they didn't know what was going on they're just voting a certain way or they're just doing certain things to oppress others they're limiting freedoms because that's what's good for the parasitic entity you could just see something like you know they live scenario occurring and it not being too far out of the realm of possibility again it kind of explains some of the behavior i think well, yeah, yeah, I, I can clearly see where that's coming from. But when I, when I did that PowerPoint, the history of UFOs, and I kind of tracked back, it became very obvious, you know, when you start looking at 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, you can literally see the development of CGI. You know, um, some of the early stuff where people were like, wow, this is absolutely amazing, you know, in 1980. By 1990, we're all, you know, pointing and laughing, you know, because it was ridiculous. Um, and, but it's now developed to a point now where it's it's almost indistinguishable, you know. Uh, I couldn't tell a real Biden from a CGI Biden. You know what I'm saying? It's like, who knows? So it's getting incredibly difficult. It's getting incredibly hard to, you know, tease out the nonsense from the real stuff, uh, which again, I think is, 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 you know, this book that's just come out now, this Europe Roswell is, it, it's a book of its time because nothing in its fate, you know, it, it, it came about at a time when we couldn't fake what had happened. Um, and then we've tried to release it without adding anything else to the story. You know, we've stuck rigidly to the facts, which is why it's not, you know, it's not like the size of war and peace. You know, it's a good couple of hours read. Uh, you know, if you kick back with a coffee in front of an open fire in winter and just get stuck in, you'll do it in two or three hours, you know. Um, I love but, like that. Well, so do I. You know, you get in at the beginning, you're hooked. and yeah. You threw it, and you know that's 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 how we did it. We did it that way on purpose. We, we've not added anything to it. Even at the end, you know, I, I took a couple of opinions in. I make a couple of you know guesses and pointers in the direction I think things should go, but I don't reach any firm conclusions. So don't expect there to be, you know, some big punchline. The punchline is the analysis itself, and you know what you guys can make of that. Um, yeah, we're not so going to run our run our colors up the mast, right? No, 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 no. In fact, in fact, at the moment, I think we're still we're still carving the mast. Mm. <laughs> Beautifully put. I love that. I'm trying to figure out what colors we want to use. Some are too pastel, yeah. and some people got a problem with it. Yeah. So, what what do you think about the official story? Uh, is that you were able to sieve down to to give us sort of a more coherent through the debris fields kind of a look at? It? Okay. Right. Um, something definitely crashed. And we have evidence of that. You know, there's archaeology, there's bits of stuff coming up, there's metal debris, loads of witnesses. Uh, you know, so yeah, summit definitely crashed, no doubt about that whatsoever. Um, most of the witnesses that have gone under analysis, um, I think I can safely say have come out smelling like a rose. They've actually come out as being quite genuine and using the modern day AI, AI, te AI technology, they've actually gone back over old document uh, documentaries that were made in the past. So Matt Brazel and several other people as well have now actually been AI'd to find out whether or not they're lying. You know, they've used um, secret services software um, analysis software, which picks up on little, very tiny details on facial movement and things like that. So what I do instinctively, just by looking at photographs, they've got AI, AI that can do that now. Um, and most of them have come out, again, smelling like a rose. So very clearly, something was recovered. Something went back to, whether it's Area 51 or another base, but something, go, something went back to somewhere. Um, 
it wouldn't surprise me if there were some kind of genetically engineered uh, creatures piloting these things. And it wouldn't surprise me if the alien technology was um, either back engineered, so it is alien, or it's super technology that was developed, you know, at the end of the Second World War. Um, I have no trouble at all accepting the fact that they've got these things in a hangar somewhere, you know, because um, I, I genuinely believe we've got them over here. It's a little passing comment I put in Europe's Roswell, actually. I had a friend. Uh, he was um, a junior squaddy in the military. He was in the army. It's quite a funny story, actually, because you know what teenagers are like. You know, you don't leave them alone in a room with an official secrets computer you know on the army network this guy was a computer that's what he he wasn't a gunny he was a computer programmer he was in the computing section so the first thing he does he gets on the computer and he's like yeah i'm gonna hack the vatican yeah why not so straight into the vatican through the jesuit website portal shut down in 30 seconds couldn't get anywhere so the next thing he does is he goes right have we got a UFO? You know, so ask the question and sure enough in a hangar somewhere down south in this country he comes up with a UFO. We've got one. We've got one parked in a hangar over here. So uh, he had nothing to gain by sharing that story with me. You know, he was a church goer. He, he, he told the truth as a rule. And he was quite shocked. He didn't know who to share the story with. And I'm like, OK, now uh, that's a common story. You know, so again, it didn't fall through the archaeological sieve. Under analysis, I think that stands up. So I think they've got them. They've got them somewhere. Um, and potentially somebody's flying them, you know. You know what I love about this is, <laughs> I, as you were talking about this, I just picture sort of, you know, 47, we're two years out of World War II, or when the atomic bomb was dropped and everything. And so we're we're doing this transition period where the Nazis were coming over. They're just trying to, you know, they're out of their homeland. They did some horrible shit over there. They're looking forward to doing horrible shit on new levels over here. And they're kind of integrating in. And then they meet with our intelligence program, whatever that looked like at the time, you know, with OSI and all that. And then they get in there and they're like, okay, well, we Americans have this biologicals program where we've been messing with all of these entities and things like that. And we have the, all these crazy beings, like check them out. They're walking around. We've got them named. They're pretty cool. And then um, the Nazis come over with these craft that they've been using. And then they just kind of park them next to each other. And then these little critters just kind of happen to wander over there and find their way into it and steal it, you know, and go out for sort of a joy ride and then crash the damn thing. And then how are they going to explain it? You know what I mean? Because the, the official story may be right wilder than anything else, um, but I wouldn't rule it out. So we need to add that to the list of possibilities. Possibilities that it was just sort well, of a mingling accident. And again, you've got, the, I mean, the Nazis, you know, that you had the Arbiner, but you had the the Department for Mysteries, you know, that went off and found yeah, things, full, you know. Yes. Well, well, they invaded Russia and the Russians have had, you know, aliens hanging, hang, have crashed UFOs since, you know, the 1930s. So there's you know, crazy shit in Serbia and honestly, Bosnia and shit. Oh, yeah. you, you know, uh, if you get into the whole Russian thing. So basically, every, every country, I would imagine, has. You know something. Uh, I, uh, you know when you get when you get to the higher levels of science. I mean, I bumped into loads of people who do genetics. They do all kinds of stuff <laughs> through archaeology. Obviously, uh, you know the thing with archaeology is it it doesn't have ist on the end. It's a shame. You yeah. know, so we're not a scientist or a physicist. You know, uh, I suppose you could have an archaeologist. Gist, yeah. but well, yeah, you, get the gist of it, you, know? you get the gist of it, yeah. But anyway, you know what I mean. We're not up there with the sort of the big boys yet. Uh, it's coming, uh, <laughs> but uh, I've met lots of these people, and and at the end of the day, they all talk to each other. So you know, if China's got a secret genetic program somewhere in you know the middle of their wilderness, you know, and they're you know they've already they've already done it. They've probably crossbred animals and humans, and goodness knows what else, you know. But they're doing that knowing what they know from the end of the Second World War. And then, like you say, you've got the Americans, the technology, you know, NASA and all that. They're doing that. You know, they've got that going on. And I'm I'm convinced they all meet up. You know, they, they all come together. Uh, I, I always have a name for these people. I call them the men in grey uh, because you never know who they are. You never hear the names. They're not public figures. You know, you will never know. You will never know who these people are. Um, you know, they're, they're sort of above the level of Men in Black. Men in Black is a PR campaign. You know, they're out there. They're, they exist. They are part of the military and they do order folks around and all the rest of it, official, official Secrets Act and all that. But there's another level. There is another level, I'm convinced, above that. And they are the Men in Grey. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Uh, and they talk to each other. So, yeah, why not? You know, why not? Uh, oh.
This holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you fuel up for brekkie, lunch, or dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian-approved, ready-to-eat meals delivered straight <laughs> to your door. They just drop them at your door, people. You'll save time and eat well. You'll stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while taking all of your holiday to-dos in stride with good meals in the tum-tum. If you're too busy with all this stuff, these meals are easy. Easy to get done. They taste great. All you've got to do is head over to factormeals.com slash expandingreality50 and use code expandingreality50 to get 50% off. That's code expandingreality50 at factormeals.com slash expandingreality50 to get 50% off. Why the fuck not? You know, yeah. maybe what's occurring here is is that there is some sort of uh, collective program going on between the countries uh, that have had either craft that have crashed that are willing to sort of say, hey, we're working on something. And maybe there is some sort of underground, perhaps delivered by physical tunnels, un literally under the ground in a place maybe where they all get together. And you may know this by who has signed the Antarctic Treaty. So maybe it's yeah. got something to do with that and that they're doing crazy shit down there because you're not allowed to go down there. You're allowed to go to one tiny little peninsula yep. and then you can fuck off from the rest of it. We know the Nazis' activity down there, allegedly and historically, with New Schwabenland and Klaus Anel Schwab's yep. like, grandfather and all that shit. So you have all these uh, crazy um, signatories to this ridiculous thing that can't can't agree on anything else as far as the <laughs> other parts of the country go, yeah. but they can say, stay the hell out of here. And it looks like, you know, it was 12 nations uh, originally. I'm uh, attempting to do this on the fly and see how many it is now. It's, yeah. it's got to be way more than that. Yeah. But there's a shit ton of um, countries and maybe this is part of sort of the, you know, the, the boys club kind of a thing where well, if you're working on stuff, you may do it down there. I can give you a lovely example of, of this because I mean I mentioned the Chinese doing you know genetic experiments out in the out in the wilds. And the reason I mentioned that is that somebody doing Google Earth research spotted them building this facility out in the middle of nowhere, uh, and they watched it. You know, they sat there and they watched them build this facility and they were trying to work out what this facility was going to be. You know, it's big and it's got labs and it's a certain layout and it's got car parking and it's miles and miles from anywhere, hundreds of miles from anywhere in the middle of nowhere. And they watched them construct all of this. Well, the person that was watching was an American and the American realized that what this thing was, was a genetics lab. So there's two questions there. First of all, what the hell are the Chinese doing with that genetics lab? And why is it out in the middle of nowhere? And why is it designed to have what appears to be human occupation? You know, it's like a, a lab designed to accommodate humans. And more to the point, how did the guy in America know what it was? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like that's the typical story of, well, there's got to be more players on the field. You know, oh, there's got to sure. be and more information in the background. So that was just one that sprung to mind. It's just a good example of this crossover. And like you say, I mean, you know, all the Germans piling into America and th th don't, don't forget that it wasn't just America that got scientists. Yeah. yeah. But they went elsewhere as well. I'm pretty sure the Russians got quite a few. Um, and then once you've got into a Soviet country, there's no reason why they then won't cross the borders into other communist countries. You know, um, they, they scattered. They, they literally scattered across the face of, of the planet. Uh, you know, this television program recently, Nazi Hunters, where they, they tracked down the actual, where Hitler ended up in Argentina and one or two of the other big players, you know. Well, Argentina's not above, you know, trading out to other places. And what's at the tip of Argentina when you fall off the bottom? Antarctica, you know. Um, yeah, so. How do you think Hitler died? Of old age, I think he was in his 90s. Uh, I think the last photograph that was taken of him, he was, I think it's either 91 or 92. And he stood there with a couple of Argentinian ladies, um, you know, outside the house that he was living in down in South America. Um, flip that the other way around. The remains that they got out of the bunker in Berlin are just nonsense. You know, the Russians didn't didn't find i mean they've done the analysis they, they, you know, hitler's skull you know they they did the, the analysis on that the dna came back female so you know 
This is well, the wonder of know, archaeology. This is uh, the beauty of archaeology. I've been hearing a bunch of crazy shit about you a know. bunch of dudes on TV actually being girls and vice versa. <laughs> and it's been like something where you can track it through history where like yeah. actors would play other roles, but it was bigger than that. It was like actual life roles. So maybe this goes back to historical leaders. Maybe this goes back like to something crazy where it's just this perception management from every angle. You just assume because they trim up some old some old gal to make that mustache look the way it does, mm -hmm. which look fake as fuck anyway. They could have just stuck it on there. Nobody questioned it. And, you know, maybe it was something like that. And um, But I do think the official story is bullshit. Uh, yeah, totally. I absolutely totally. think that he uh, ran down there to Argentina and popped out of a submarine. I heard he died drunk in the ocean just because he got old and drunk and fell asleep in the ocean or fell down or something. Oh, well, died of old age. Definitely yeah. died of old age. I, I don't think they'd have lost his body, though. I think where, wherever he is, he's buried somewhere. Uh, and a bit like, you know, the search for the mythical Holy Grail, he'll, he will turn up sooner or later. Somebody is going to, you know, say, yeah, this is where he is and what we did with him kind of thing. Uh, even if they cremated him, there'd still be a location somewhere that you could, you know, track back to uh, potentially. Well, probably, maybe there's a few paintings out there because, you know, he probably just went back to Argentina and just started painting again like he should have, you know, in the first yeah, place. No, no one will have kept, nobody will have kept those. They're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, as soon as he's gone, they just burn them all. They're like, oh, yeah, thank God. Yeah. Take all this shit down oh, now yeah, yeah. Take them down. These are rubbish. We're <laughs> no, not keeping these. We know? like it anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. So... Uh, with with these uh, new Roswell findings that you have, there's some yeah. lab tests that I heard about. So what what's exciting about the new test findings that you've seen? Okay, um, well, just to sort of round things up, we got the material because something hit trees and scattered across four fields, sheep fields, and somehow a newspaper report got out in the Sunday Express, which then got passed on to Gary, who went and interviewed Earl, the farmer. By the time Gary got there, massive military cleanup operation, nothing left, but there were still a few fragments left in the trees. So starting the analysis off, what we had was we had two pieces of foil and six pieces of metal that they got out of these trees. About a month later, the Forestry Commission destroys the woods. They just demolish it. So the woods is gone. The fields are cleared. Essentially, there's nothing on site now. It's it's all cleared. That's the end of it. Uh, and the farmer doesn't really want the location giving away and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we did what we could 2008 with the documentary, but we still have the pieces. Now, Gary was visited by the men in black, who I mentioned earlier, asking for the pieces back. And what Gary had done was he'd snapped one of these fragments up into tiny chunks and put them into key rings and given them out to people. And when these guys came to get the metal back, he said, oh, I'm sorry, guys, you're a bit late because your metal's all over the place. And he yeah. said, and if you get back in your unmarked SUVs and you drive off, um, I'll, I'll keep it a secret and I won't tell any of these people to give the key rings to the media. And they were like, mm -hmm. okay. So they left him with these pieces. So um, he managed to get one of these bits to British Aerospace over here. British Aerospace did an informal analysis. So we start with that. That's in the 80s and 90s. Um, and they basically sent back and said, well, we don't know what the hexagonal green rubbery stuff on it is. Um, we don't know what the resin is, but we can tell you that it's duralumin. At which point everyone goes, hey, duralumin, we know what it is. Well, if you look duralumin up, it's been kicking around since the 1920s, 1930s. It's just a, a, a trade name for an aluminium alloy that they used in airships and things like that during the Second World War. So at that point, you could say, OK, maybe that's, you know, the British military trying to cover up whatever it really is. But they were actually correct when they said it's aluminium. It is aluminium because... Fast forward to now. We sent one sample to Australia and one sample to America. And the Australian sample came back and they said, it's aluminium foam. And we're like, what on earth is that? What the hell's aluminium foam? Well, apparently you can mix aluminium with another substance that causes it to foam, makes it froth. And this froth then goes back to solid aluminium at room temperature. It's a chemical process and it produces extremely strong, extremely lightweight aluminium. Are they then come back with this analysis and said, well, you know, we know what the resin is. It's just a standard American type glue. They quoted what it was. And they said, but we still can't really tell you what this green painted surface is. Well, that came as a bit of a shock 
for two reasons. First of all, we assume that all the debris was the same. And actually, all the debris isn't the same. We've got at least two, possibly three, different parts of the ship. So the bit they got is the bit that's painted green. So you've got this, this sheet metal that's painted green. And the second big shock is, well, that stuff didn't exist in 1983. Didn't exist. Didn't have aluminium foam. Was not developed. Wasn't even in development as far as anybody knows. Um, and it would have had to have been in development from the 1970s for it to have been in use in a practical vehicle that crashed in the 1980s, early 80s. So that's the first surprise. So you read the Australian report and you think, OK, fair cop. You know, yeah, it's aluminium. It's right. That's what British Aerospace said it was. Then the third test comes whizzing in from America. They got a chunk of the metal that had the green hexagons on it. So that's a different fragment that. That comes whizzing back and they go, OK, we've done the analysis uh, and it's come back. We have no idea what it is. It's an exotic metal. It's an exotic material. We've never seen anything like this before. Um, and it's lanthium. It's lanthanum. Okay, at which point you then have to you know, Google, you know, Wikipedia, find out what the hell this lanthanum is. Lanthanum's quite common. When it says it's an exotic metal, what it means is it's everywhere. It's like number 27 in the list of most common materials on planet Earth. But it also turns up in meteorites and in comets and in galaxies. So it's a space metal. There's no doubt about that. But this is the this is the real punchline is it costs millions of pounds or dollars to extract. It's really difficult to get it in a pure form. So, OK, uh, this is pure. It's 90, whatever, 94, 95 percent pure lanthanum, lanthium. But, and this is the other thing, when the crash occurred and this debris was scattered, the farmer reported sheets of this that were six foot, like two metres of sheets, and it's covering four fields. So then you're thinking, hang on a minute, you're not talking tens of thousands of dollars here, you're talking about tens of millions of dollars to get this metal out, and you're talking about 1970s going into early 1980s. So both of the substances, although they exist now, and although we can make them now with a certain amount of difficulty, because the lanthium is particularly exotic, they certainly did not exist 40 years ago, as far as anybody's concerned. So you could, in a way, you could forgive British Aerospace for going, you know, it's aluminium. That's the best we can say. Because even if it existed back then, they wouldn't necessarily have known what it was. It was just an exotic uh, mix of, of different things. And then you could sort of forgive the Australians for going, well, OK, yeah, we think it's this glue and we think it's this material because they got a different sample from the Americans. So clearly we know which which sample went to British Aerospace in Australia. The Americans, on the other hand, have absolutely no idea whatsoever what the hell this thing is. It's got the same grey resin on it, so it's not a normal, regular, standard American type of glue. It isn't. So that's a mistake. The Australians have clearly got that wrong, or it's a deliberate attempt to try and dumb it down and say, Hang on a minute. We've we've just burnt our fingers on this one. You know, this is official secret sack stuff. So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll tell them it's aluminium foam, and then we'll you know cover that up by identifying the rest as common elements. Nobody has identified the green paint. Nobody has identified the green hexagonal rubbery stuff, which apparently is electrically conductive. So you've still got a couple of elements that are totally unknown, and the ones that we can identify didn't exist in 1983 when it crashed. <laughs> this is wild. It's making me think of the Bob Lazar uh, with the element 115. Remember? Because he said, oh, there's yeah. an element 115. I've been messing with it. I actually have some in my pocket. And then um, years later, uh, this apparently got added to the periodic table of elements. It's a thing that we discovered, air quotes, that's really fascinating. Well, that, that's what I've done in the book. I've actually put the periodic table in and I've highlighted the exotic uh, minerals in the additional piece that's been added to it so you can see where the things are coming from perfect yeah 
I have got to ask you about this part of the story. Um, I would be remiss if I did not. So the I-beam, allegedly, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, uh, when the newspaper article came out for the crash over here, it included two things. It said that there was a beam of some kind or there was a structure of some kind found with the debris that had, quote, code numbers on it and something that resembled an aerial. Um, when I interviewed the farmer, he actually didn't remember either of those. So we have no idea where this original report in the newspaper came from. So any details on on our version of Roswell over here, the Clanilla crash, and any sort of information to do with that must have come from somebody else. So clearly the story came from local police, local press or local military. Uh, it didn't come from the farmer. But then, you know, that kind of adds a bit of truth to it because if everything all added up and everything was perfect, you know, you'd assume folks could have been making it up. On the other hand, this, this is interesting. Um, yeah, we don't actually have the beam. That's a copy. It's a reconstruction. I yeah, think, somebody on Etsy a is doing a great job of uh, yeah. producing copies of these. If you guys want to get one, actually, it'd make a pretty dope uh, ruler. You know what yeah. I mean? If yeah, you yeah. Make that sort of like a fun ruler to do projects so and shit on. So yeah. that's some it's it's something that's developed over the the years since the since the crash at Roswell that the description of the beam and the the sketches done at the time have now developed into into that as a sort of finished product. Um, I'm going to venture to say if we actually had the original beam in front of us, it probably wouldn't look exactly like that, you know. Um, but yeah, it's possible. But um, it's possible, but slightly meaningless. <laughs> I agree. I mean, it's yeah. so intriguing and bizarre. It's such like, um, first of all, if it's sort of a structure thing, then they have, uh, you know, some sort of reference for putting these symbols on it. Maybe they're just decorative and that's fun. You know, they had an opportunity to punch cool things in it and make it a little fun for themselves. Or maybe it's uh, utilitarian in some nature. Who knows? But it is an interesting physical, uh, alleged physical evidence piece to this story because it is so bizarre. It's just such a, because what is it, like four feet long, like an inch though. Um, yeah. like an inch big or something like that. It's not very large and it's very lightweight. So again, they sort of say that, oh, you can tell that that's why it's space stuff because of how <laughs> lightweight it is and how it would support this whole craft because it definitely came from here. Um, I, th I think it's an interesting misdirection or not. It's a fun bit of the story and I'm, gr I'm grateful yeah. that, you know, you had something to say about it because I was just curious because I've, it sort of, you know, now ties into the, the symbols now sort of look like what is touted as uh, one of, uh, Europe's Roswell's, which is the Rundlesham Enigma, where it had those yeah. series of uh, images on the side of it because they look kind of space agey and similar, but also they look like if you gave a, a captain, like told him to go home and have his uh, dart, daughter who smokes pot and is art, in art college <laughs> create some ang um, alien language for you to stick on a craft that you're fucking uh, yeah. with to deceive the public. Maybe it's something yeah. like that. It just doesn't look the... I don't know. This is me judging the shit, but it, I just, again, find it interesting and thank you for talking about it. I just thought, well, yeah, cool. I mean, if, 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 if these little alien guys that are sort of sat there, you know, flying all these things, uh, going back to a previous book that I wrote, crystal schools and human heads, you know, these things have big heads. Yeah. You've probably got a copy I've knocking around it. somewhere, I but usually have it yeah. right here and I'm reading it off somewhere else or I have it well, somewhere else. Anyway, in that book, I point book. out that if, if you've got this enormous brain, then you're super intelligent. You know, that's pretty obvious. So I, I, I'm struggling to see the reason why, as indeed you point out, they would want to run a load of symbols up a beam. You know, it's like, it's because if, if you're that intelligent, why? Why would you bother? You know, <laughs> it's a why would you bother, but also it's a what if it's functional and what if it's not just um, beauty? You know, because we look at it and we yeah. look like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, just like uh, characters, like Russian or Chinese characters or something like that. They just look maybe interesting, maybe again, utilitarian. Maybe it was just a piece of above the door that just says, don't hit your head, you know, and that's <laughs> it. And then that's the piece yeah. that broke off. And it is utilitarian in that way. But uh, or maybe it's a stencil, you know, um, yeah, yeah. You know, maybe it's just some little kid stencil that was riding around on the thing. And it is a ruler and it's just something decorative that somebody came up with you. It's just so yeah. interesting because, again, you could you could think to anything like look around your room and mm. look at anything in it. And like this Allen wrench, for instance, uh, this could yeah. be like buried in the backyard or something like this. And then millions of years from now, somebody find this and be like, oh, my God, what did this do? It started you yeah. know, maybe they had sex with it or something like they don't know. You know, it depends on like sort of the mind of the time <laughs> of the people and what they're capable of anthropomorphizing yeah. as to what's possible to kind of how they describe what they find of yours. 
It's well, well the, the, the things on the beam are, are clearly like hieroglyphs, but the big difference is, as an archaeologist, if, if you look at hieroglyphs, they are pictograms. Yes. So they do obey rules. They do work to a system. They do communicate things on many different levels. But like you said, you look at that eye beam and you think, you know, were they stoned when they did this? You know, is, is this someone's art college project? You right. know, it's... And if it is a language of some sort, there's no repeating symbols on it. So they're no. all unique symbols, you know? So there, again, is no sort of character delineation. Oh my God, I don't even know what's happening. Okay. So there is no sort of character delineation. This is the same one, just uh, yeah, twice. Yeah, flipped. Yeah. So, and and sort of, you know, this sort of looks like a spade from a card. Like, um, yeah, just kind of interesting. Again, I'm not judging the artwork of this alien talented being here, but it does look... <laughs> Like I don't know how utilitarian it is, you know, to a purpose. Ooh, well, and, and from from a hier from a hieroglyphic point of view, of course, you, the word meaningless springs to mind. Mm. Uh, as you say, even if there was just one repeat, then it would be logical, you know. Um, no matter how big your alphabet is, sooner or later, in you know whatever system, mathematics or binary or whatever, you you've got to have a repeat. There's got to be repeats. So it's a bit fishy that there aren't any repeats. Yeah, um, even the, the you know. predator language had sort of a cuneiform, digital cuneiform. Well, yeah, that that, that is actually, I think it's based on Sumerian or, or Babylonian cuneiform, and that actually does make sense. I think there is a, a language for the predator one. Because this is the thing, you see, you work back, you work back, you start off with meaning and you create the language and it, then it moves forward. Otherwise, why have the language in the first place, which is my point about being super intelligent. You know, if, if, if you can telepathically chat to the bloke next to you and you've got all the knowledge in the universe, you know, and you're so technologically advanced that things come up as light images, you know, and because we're at that now with science fiction. Now we're looking at holographic control, you know, and, and sensitivity and what have you. Um, that might have been high tech when the thing came down in 1947 and I was like, oh, you know, when Star Trek was still, you know, didn't exist and aliens were still people dressed up. You're back on that level. You know, we've we've come so far as a human race that it's getting less believable. You know, that beam is is less acceptable. A bit like what I was saying about CGI, you know, in the 1980s, where you can see the mat lines around the outside, you know, and the lighting's wrong and you name it. And, you know, we've come yeah. so far. What what we really need to be doing is looking at evidence that that hasn't been debunked, you know, that is proving difficult to debunk. Back to the analysis. I mean, me and Philip Mantle, the publisher, we uh, we were sort of thinking, yeah, we'll get this analysed, you know, it'll all come back with this amazing result and we'll have solved the mystery, you know, 40 years on, that'll be the answer, you know. Uh, no, no, it's just made it worse, you know, just which like is... Him and yeah. uh, Dr. Irena Scott, I just had them on about yeah. the Pascagoula case. It keeps yeah. getting crazier and more interesting. More witnesses keep coming forward. I think yeah. them and Darcy Weir are doing a documentary about it, which is cool as shit. Yeah, it's, I mean, ab absolutely. I mean, that, that in a sense, that proves the genuineness of a case. If you get to a point where you can debunk a case, you can nail it to the wall and, you know, it becomes obviously acceptable that it's fake for the following reasons. Well, then it was never real in the first place. You know, you can't argue your way out of that one. But this is going the opposite way. This The, the rabbit hole is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Clearly, we are now on to, you know, territory that, well, it's Roswell, isn't it? You know, they're going to want to clean it up. They're going to want to hide it. They're going to want to make it go away. You know, and actually, I feel as if we're actually knocking on the door of disclosure with this one, because that's where UFOs are going. That's the next big step. You know, someone's going to walk out onto the White House lawn, hopefully not Biden, you know, holding the hand of a little green man who's going to go, hi, I'm the pilot, you know, and then they're going to wheel this big disc out and go, yeah, this is what we've been flying around in for the last, you know, 70, 80, 90 years. But we're getting closer, you know, we're getting closer. This, this book will take us one step nearer to that because now we know what the compounds are that are in the metals that are in these vehicles that are crashing, you know, it's, it's step by step. I don't think we're going to exactly kick open the door of disclosure, but we're kind of scratching at it. You know, we're, we're getting there. It's wild. If we are going to yeah. have the scenario that you talked about, I prefer it with the current members and whatever kind of political systems we have, it be more of a Mars attack scenario <laughs> where they come in and just blood mist the whole yeah. goddamn thing. Yeah. yeah. I, 
it, it's a fascinating case again that uh, just continues to get uh, more interesting. And so, when whenever you take a stab at something like this, what what do folks tell you? Um, you know, because I'm just curious what your colleagues say about something like this. Whenever you're like, oh, I'm doing a book about yeah. Roswell. Do the, how many? Yeah. Do you get the That's eye rolls? Good. Do you get the how many books do we need about <laughs> Roswell or? Colleagues, I've not had colleagues for ages. <laughs> no, I shouldn't have said that when you're drinking. Uh, <laughs> colleagues, what are they? Um, actually, actually, the, the the reaction I've tended to get, um, bear in mind the last three books I've put out have been more than edgy. I mean, uh, let's face it, the Crystal Schools on Human Heads is, is genetics, you know, so I'm going down the sort of the Andrew Collins and all that kind of you know, real, you know, very, very far out left field sort of archaeology. But a lot of people have said with that, yeah, we like we like the speculation. So that that's all right. I'm I'm singing off the same hymn sheet. The King Arthur one, I mean, that has just Bang. you know, yeah, it's like putting dynamite under everybody. You know what I mean? Um and there's been massive rows as to whether or not the material's valid, whether it's genuine, this like I don't care because I, I did my, you know, I've done my diligence on that one. So I think that actually is that's upset more people, I think, than than the UFO book has. Uh, but Europe's Roswell's come out. Um, I've, I've had two book reviews up to now, both of which have been fab. And they've both gone off to what I would call scientific UFO publications. You know, they've gone off and they've said, yeah, this book is, you know, in fact, one of them said destined to become a classic, uh, which I think it is. You know, I think it is because because we are starting to knock at the door of disclosure. It's going to be the first book of a new generation that's going to, you know, really sort of push people to start to release information. Uh, and then as a rule, if you look at the rest of the archaeological establishment in this country and people I know, um, which I do know quite a lot of, if I'm being honest, most of them are like, we are so glad you're doing this because then we don't have to. You know, um, they've all got access to grind. They're all attached to, you know, academic institutions. They've all got funding. They've all got careers. You know, this, that, the other. Well, you know, you get to a certain age and you kind of think, you know, career? I might not still be alive in 10 years. You know, what the hell's a career? So you you kind of have nothing to lose, you know, and, and that's it. Out it goes. Uh, and that's really where I'm at. I'm at like, you know, hey, I live on this planet too. You know, I, I've got mysteries and things I need to talk about. You know, there's issues I'm dealing with. So as a rule, to answer your original question, I, I think the establishment, whoever they are now, I think they're pushing it forward. They're pushing what I'm doing forward, you know. Um, and I do stand on the shoulders of giants. I mean, there's a lot of folks that give me information. Um, and without naming names, quite a lot of those are, you know, fairly high up professional archaeologists. Um, although, and this is where it gets interesting, um, you sort of, how can I put it? Popular archaeologists of my type who appear on television a lot and get interviewed a lot, sell a lot of books a lot, you know, um, don't tend to exchange information with me um, because I think they still think that I'm establishment. Does that make sense? Because yeah, I'm getting yeah. my information from establishment sources. You know, I mean, the, most of that book, that King Arthur book, came from a top archaeologist who's been, you know, he's 40 plus years of archaeology digging in, in what is effectively Camelot, you know, the city of Chester. I, I can't name drop him. I mean, anyone can do the research and go and find out who he is. But I he, I had carte blanche permission off him to use all his published material. And he appeared in Lost Treasures and off camera you know, we spent hours and hours and hours over pints of beer in, you know, weird, obscure corners of Scotland, you know, discussing this this book, which eventually has come out. I, I know he's cheering me on. I mean, he actually said, he said, if you ever come to make a documentary, I'll I'll appear on, on camera for you and nobody else, you know. And there's, there's a lot of them over here like that, you know. I think you probably draw the line at Alice Roberts. I don't think Alice Roberts had talked to me, um, but a lot of the others will. Uh, she's still got a career, you know, she's still got a, a family and an income and you know, it needs to support them rather than diving off the edge of planet Earth, which is what I do best. Um, Her ability to adapt, though, we'll see how well she we'll, survives. If yeah, we'll see. people cling to that old narrative that we're all saying, but there's more evidence, at least look at it. And they're like, no, 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 no. close my eyes, yeah. I'm not looking at it. I can't hear anything you're saying. That's yeah. the that's where the damage has been the entire time, because it is folks like you. And I, I knew what your answer was going to be, which is why I asked. I like to hear you go <laughs> off on the establishment every time. 
And uh, so your badger poking, yeah. your badger poking, you're poking me with a badger poking spoon. <laughs> well, sir, it's enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yes, it's just what you're doing, Mark, is just always fucking awesome, man. Um, so I tell you what, we're going to wrap it here in a little bit, but I want to know what you want folks to know about this uh, case and what they can look forward to in the book, which will be linked below, as well as all the other ways to find you, the other episodes that you add here with us. So what's what's a final word about Roswell? Well, OK, um, well, I've already name dropped three books. So I'm, I'm not going to advertise any books. I'm not going to talk about books at all. Forget the books. Just go and get them off Amazon. Okay, there you go. Bubba, done. <laughs> go and find them on Amazon. You know, three days later, click, click, pay, click, collect. It'll come through your door. You know, it's, it's dead simple. Uh, excuse me. With this case, we've just put the original 2008 documentary up on YouTube. It only went up the first week in November. So it's worth knowing now, if you go to a, a, a company site, hosted by Drake, Michigan. It's all one word, Drake, Michigan. Uh, they've put up all of me back catalogue. So actually, it's the latest documentary in a series of documentaries, and all 22 episodes of Lost Treasures are now up on their site, plus six extras, plus loads of other stuff. I mean, the Disappearing Ninth Legion documentary, which went up last month, is completely original. It's never been released anywhere ever. And I, in my opinion, it's the best one we've ever done. It was finished in 2019. Uh, it was killed off by lockdown, by the pandemic and that. But it's worth going and have a, having a look. But yeah, Europe's Roswell documentary, done in 2008, 25-year anniversary. So if you want to see moving pictures and you want to see the actual interviews, that's the place to go and have a look at that. Um, but, Give me the you know, website the book, one more time. It's Drake, Michigan. Drake, Michigan is the website. They're hosting all of the, the videos. Okay, thank you. Um, but you can just, you know, search YouTube. The, but the point is it's there. You can go and get it now. Well, I pull and up then, your Lost Treasures all the time and just watch it for the intro song yeah. music alone. I love that <laughs> shit, dude. You are rocking with your, your goth album. Oh, yeah. You yeah, yeah. Badass. It's, a, it's fascinating, too, what you're talking about, man. It's a badass yeah, show. Yeah. Uh, and then if anybody wants me, well, usual thing, I'm on Facebook, so just, just come and friend me. Um, as long as you're not Fifi Trixabel with a butterfly as your, you know, photo and no nothing on your site in which case i won't because i'll be very suspicious you don't really exist uh, as long as you really exist and you come and friend me <laughs> you know i'll accept you um and then you can talk to me on messenger you know which is part of facebook so so there you go you got amazon you've got drake michigan youtube and you've got facebook and messenger uh come find me um, beautiful as well as episode 117 and 192, respectively, will be located down below. Mark Ollie, I'll see you in a couple of weeks for our next Frequency Theorist, my friend. And it is just so cool every damn time we get to hang out. And I just thank you so much. And I'm grateful that you're in my experience, dude. So thank you again. Thank you. Well, it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs>